Don't look down. Keep your eyes on the road. Hold on tight. Never give up. And you might survive the world's most extreme. These are the craziest, deadliest, most extreme destinations on Earth. Around the world, we see daring rescues, extreme white water, high-speed chases, and devastating destruction. These are the world's most extreme waterways. First, we head to a man-eating river in the heart of Africa, the legendary Congo. The Congo River is without doubt one of the world's greatest rivers. It's the deepest river in the world, and it moves the second largest amount of water. It's Africa's most powerful river, and at its core, the world's biggest and deadliest rapids, the Inga Falls. They're known as the Gates of Hell, a terrifying 15-mile-long churning mass of extreme white water with whirlpools the size of boxing rings. For centuries, the Congo River was considered inexplorable. The impenetrable rapids blocked the river. Despite attempts, no one has crossed them and made it out alive. October 2011. South African extreme kayaker Steve Fisher and his team prepare for the challenge of a lifetime to become the first people ever to paddle down the Congo's Inga Falls. I've always known about these rapids, but considered them to be impossible. After six years of preparation, it's time to hit the Congo. They'll take four days to kayak the whole length of the rapids. You see these massive whirlpools forming. And those were the main obstacles we had to avoid. Suddenly, the river strikes. Unexpectedly, a whirlpool came up behind me and sucked me under. Steve is trapped. He struggles for over a minute to free himself from his kayak. That was an extremely terrifying moment and the only time that I thought I was going to die. Steve broke upside down. Where is he? I was underwater. I came out of my kayak. I saw his paddleboard. I'm back on the surface. I'm totally out of breath. My head's pounding, and my team comes paddling up to me. You all right? Steve is lucky to be alive. I was as physically beaten down as you can possibly be. The guys literally had to drag me to shore. It made me realize that I don't want to drown in a kayak, and that we need to treat this with the utmost respect. The Congo has given him a brutal scare but just the next day, Steve's back in his kayak, ready to tackle the heart of the rapids. Here we go. The falls are the pinch point for the entire 2,900-mile length of the Congo. Every minute, 55 million cubic feet of water flows over these sharp rocks. This river was so much bigger than us, and we were merely hanging on by a thread. The elite kayakers are battered, bruised, and exhausted. But after four days on the river, they make it through. What we had accomplished could never be taken away from us. They've done it. The first men ever to survive the Congo's gates of hell. I was relieved rather than victorious. There was no sense of we conquered this river. There was a humbling sense of having been let through. This time, Steve and his team escape with their lives. But they're aware of the odds and know 
Next time, the Congo may not be so forgiving. The Congo is known for its white water, but true terror comes when raging water strikes without warning. A placid Rocky Mountain river that's hiding a deadly secret. It has the power to suddenly wipe out whole towns. Back in 1976, northern Colorado was hit by heavy thunderstorms. Flash floods took the lives of 143 people. I've never in my life experienced anything like that. They called it the storm of the century, a freak event. Few thought it would happen again. But Mother Nature had other ideas. September 12th, 2013. In Colorado, a huge storm has dropped six months' worth of rain in just four days. Now firefighters are battling flash floods. It was pretty remarkable in just the amount of rain we had and how fast it came. Runoff from the mountains quickly changes small rivers into raging monsters. Severe thunderstorms can dump up to 12 inches of rain over a matter of hours, and that's all it takes. The mountain canyons act like funnels, turning the freak rainfall into a flash flood. Just like in 1976, 20-foot-high walls of water race down the canyon at 4,000 cubic feet per second. It's an irresistible force of nature, destroying everything in its path. And as it builds, lives are at stake. It washed away huge roadways. The entire communities were taken out. The rain is relentless. And it brings a fresh emergency. A small creek is now so fierce that it destroys a highway bridge. Cars plunge into the water below. Firefighters Rob Williams and John Cook are quickly on the scene. We saw a victim waving at us, and then we knew that he was a confirmed rescue. John and I went over on the raft, and we were controlled by two teams on the shores with ropes. We were able to pull that first victim out on the boat. Fighting the raging torrent, Rob and John succeed in getting the driver to safety. But it's not over yet. Nearby, an overturned car and another motorist missing. We didn't know if uh, that person had flushed, flushed out and downriver and had gotten out. Our first initial mission was to go out and investigate to see if there was anybody inside the vehicle. I crawled up on the vehicle. Whoa, 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 whoa. In Colorado, a swollen mountain creek has burst its banks and washed away a bridge. A car is upside down in the water, and a driver's trapped inside. Once we heard some sort of life from inside the vehicle, it definitely changed our game plan. It, we took it a little bit more risk at that point. Firefighters Rob Williams and John Cook must act fast. We knew that if there's someone in there, we will put our lives on the line to, to save them and, and pull them out. We took the chain from a tow truck and pulled it up right side. The rushing water tosses the car around. It's a fight to pull the car right side up. We were able to break the window, and that's when the hand came out. Time was really important, and we had a short window to get him out. 
You see that moment slip away when you realize, I, I may have just seen this man for the last time. The raging current battles against Rob and John's efforts. We're his last chance to get out. Seconds feel like hours. They don't know if the driver is alive. We were able to reach inside and unlock the door. When we were able to get that door open and able to see him come out again, um, very cold and hypothermic, but uh, relatively OK, it was, it was a huge relief. The driver is one of the lucky ones. Others are less fortunate. This time, the Colorado floods claim eight lives and destroy over a billion dollars worth of property. Experts say this won't happen again for at least another 100 years. But they said that 37 years before, and Colorado's canyon rivers didn't listen. From wild white water, we're going to the eighth wonder of the world, the Panama Canal. Around the planet, we've built astonishing ways of carrying waterways over land. Mighty ancient aqueducts, huge water bridges, even an elevator for boats. And the mightiest of them all, the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal has to be one of the most ambitious engineering projects in the history of humankind. The 50-mile-long canal shaves 8,000 miles off the journey from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It's the world's greatest shipping shortcut. It literally reduces the price of sneakers, televisions, and cars for everybody. 15,000 ships squeeze through the canal every year. But there's a problem. The canal is running at near full capacity. And a traffic jam on this highway costs millions. Worse still, this 20th century marvel can't handle some 21st century ships. The current locks are 110 feet wide. Sounds big, but it's a tight fit for today's super tankers. And the ships are getting wider and wider. Panama needs a bigger canal. The price tag is $5 billion. Construction teams are digging out vast new channels and building gigantic new locks, 70 feet wider than the ones in use today. That will allow ships up to 180 feet wide and 1,400 feet long, which will double the amount of tonnage that can pass through the canal. The expansion project, due for completion in 2015, will be a game changer. And once again, the world's largest ships will glide through the world's mightiest waterway. From the mightiest waterway to the most criminal, California's Pacific Coast. The golden beaches of Southern California. People come here to sunbathe, surf, and smuggle illegal drugs. This stretch of water is a superhighway for drugs entering the U.S. Every year, 100 tons of narcotics are seized in the waters off this coastline. San Diego, the U.S. Coast Guard's western front in the war on drugs. Their mission is to stop smuggling in these coastal waters. 
it's difficult. Um, it's a large ocean. There's a lot, a lot of water out there to patrol. With over a thousand miles of shoreline to protect, the Coast Guard uses helicopters to spot the drug gangs. But to catch the bad guys, they've got to hit the waves. We're kind of the tip of the spear in, as far as interdiction goes. Even if we were having aircraft overhead, uh, we still need a boat on scene. Today's fast response crew are heading down to the Mexican border. We go all the way down to the border. I'm trying to stay out of the uh, Mexican territorial waters. The border is just 20 miles down the coastline, a trip of just 30 minutes in these patrol boats. Oh, we're down here at the border. You see the fence there? My job is to uh, protect this border. And to tell you the truth, I don't care where they're coming from as long as they don't get into our waters. This sea border and its defenders are under siege from powerful drug cartels. The gangs are so sophisticated that they ferry the drugs up to America in homemade underwater submersibles called narco subs. But for the final leg of the journey, they use speedy fishing boats, perfect for the quick dash along the California coast. In this high seas cat and mouse game, the Coast Guard knows the drugs are out there. They've just not found them yet, but they will. In the waters off California, the U.S. Coast Guard spots a suspicious vessel. When we get the call that something suspicious is going on, you want to get out as fast as you can. On board the Coast Guard cutter, team members get ready for action. We're always approaching a vessel as if they're armed. It's extremely dangerous uh, operation. Your senses have to become more aware. The smugglers are on the run, but the Coast Guard vessels have the speed for the chase. Once we get in position, we have to go over the loud hailer, inform the United States Coast Guard. The smugglers ignore the Coast Guard's warning. We can do anything from warning shots and also disabling fire. Shots to the engine stop the boat dead in the water. These smugglers have a one-way ticket to jail. America's fight against drug traffickers is ongoing. And in the waters off California, the Coast Guard remained vigilant. From a fight with drug cartels to a battle with Mother Nature in the seas of Cape Horn. Here, the Pacific, Atlantic, and Southern Oceans collide at the tip of South America. The roaring oceans create the most ferocious seas known to man. There is nowhere that compares in terms of the reliability of storms, dangerous seas, and making you seasick. 100-foot waves and hurricane-strength winds. You have to be brave, crazy, or both to tackle these waters. It's rough, it's dangerous, it's terrifying. And believe me, it's not much fun. January 6, 2009. Veteran yachtsman Jean Lecam is approaching Cape Horn in a non-stop solo race around the world. This unique stretch of water is a deadly cocktail of storms, complex currents, and stray icebergs. Rounding the horn, as it's known, is a nightmare for even the best of sailors, as Lecam quickly finds out. It happened in a few seconds. My boat must have hit something. The boat strikes a small iceberg and capsizes. At that point, your survival instinct kicks in. Lecam sets off an emergency signal and shelters in a pocket of air at the front of his boat. Luckily, fellow competitors receive his distress call and race to the rescue. When they reach Lecam's boat 16 hours later, they have no idea if he has survived. 
So I opened a hatch in the hull and put a little flag through it to show that I was still alive inside. Lecam leaves the boat and clings onto the rudder in the stormy waves. After three attempts, his rescuers are able to throw Lecam a rope and pull him to safety. Lecam's ordeal with Cape Horn's terrifying seas is over. That's it. A moment in time, a sailor's story. From the roughest seas to the world's hardest river, the Fraser on Canada's Pacific coast. It's a mighty river. And one that makes you work hard for every buck. The tides and the currents get pretty extreme. The Fraser is a lumber superhighway, running from the Rockies to downtown Vancouver. It's the only road big enough to carry huge quantities of wood from the mountain forests to the sawmills. You can have up to 20,000 logs in a tow. But sometimes the river bites back. Whenever you mix unpredictable weather and currents with enormous towing loads and work boats, there's going to be danger. It's an early morning in the dead of winter. The Fraser River is at high tide. And tugboat captain Curtis McKenzie is towing 20,000 logs through the swells. When you're towing barges or logs, it gives you quite a Quite a challenge. Today's load, called a tow, is the length of four football fields. That dwarfs the load of any road truck. Three quarters of a million dollars worth of lumber. Nine hours into his journey, Curtis faces the challenge of getting his huge tow through the Patulo Bridge. If you're going to a bridge, you have to be on your game. The tow can do three different directions all at once. The river's constantly changing currents and tides are jostling the tow, threatening to break it apart. You really do have to pay attention to what you're doing. It takes Curtis's years of experience to keep the tow together. If your tow breaks, it can take days and days to get everything put back together. To keep the logs bound up in the tow, you need to get out of the boat and onto the water. Meet Gordon Foss. His job is as hardcore as it gets. I gotta be ready if something goes wrong, which it does quite often. I just ready to fix it. The Fraser's currents are loosening the logs. It's a constant struggle to keep them together like getting paid to go to the gym. Gordon spots a problem with one of the outer logs. We got to put a preventer on this stick here. It's cracked on the end. He uses a metal cable to stop the log from splitting and breaking loose. Gordon skips over the moving logs as they are pulled down river. It's an extreme game of hopscotch. Your cork boots can pick up bark and stuff, so you'll slip on that, almost like you're on ice. Slip, and you get a sudden soaking. In the wintertime, the water, it, uh, it gets real cold. It's a hazard that comes with the job. You can fall in the water 10, 20 times a day. You, you're usually out pretty quick. Mighty currents and freezing water, all part of grinding on a living on the world's hardest working river. Next, a lagoon that appears destined to drown a global icon. Today, communities around the world are under threat from waterways. From erosion to devastating flash floods, 
and rising sea levels. But in Italy, the entire city of Venice is at risk. Bridges, hotels, palaces, and a quarter million people's homes could disappear beneath the waves unless a $7 billion engineering project rises to the rescue. Venice, the most beautiful city on Earth. Every year, the Lagoon City draws 15 million tourists from around the world, eager to see the bridges, piazzas, and palaces. But Venice's sidewalks sit just inches above the canal's waterline. And every year, high tides in the Adriatic Sea cause sudden floods. They put a dampener on romantic vacations, and Venetian business owners pay the price. Today's going a little bit better, but yesterday, it was a disaster. On these flood days, Venice turns from a beautiful city into a soggy mess. And it's about to get a whole lot worse. Venice is sinking a little bit every year. Over the last hundred years, the city has sunk nine inches. And it's continuing to do so. At the same time, the sea level is also rising. It's a deadly combination for the city. In 20 years, the city could sink another three inches. And eventually, it could be a modern-day Atlantis. This extreme predicament needs an extreme solution. It's called Moses. We are doing something that nobody has done before. This colossal $7 billion project aims to protect Venice from rising sea levels. In a, such a big uh, job, uh, an, ambitious, an ambitious job, because we are working with huge structures. They're building a series of huge floodgates at the three entrances to the lagoon. The barriers work in a very simple way. They consist of 20 gates that can be lifted very quickly by injecting compressed air. When the Adriatic is at high tide, these gates will be deployed, separating Venice's lagoon from the rising sea. Since beginning in 2003, the project's running years behind schedule. Construction teams are working around the clock to make the new 2016 completion date. Meanwhile, many wonder what will happen first. Venice succumbing to a watery grave, or the seawall of Moses saving the day by parting the waters. From a race against time, we go to a nightmare day on Japan's Pacific coast. Millions of people live and work along 19,000 miles of usually tranquil coastline. The sea is indispensable to our lives. But these people are also aware that the indispensable sea has the power to destroy. Japan sits on what we call the Ring of Fire. That means there's a lot of earthquakes. Earthquakes around here mean one thing, tsunamis. March 11th, 2011. A massive earthquake strikes 45 miles off the coast of Japan. It measured 9.0 on the Richter scale, and it was the most powerful earthquake ever recorded off Japan. The earthquake triggers a giant tsunami. Members of the Japanese Coast Guard are the first to cite the force of nature. Their ship rides over the wave. Others won't be so lucky. In the quiet fishing town of Ohunato, local business owner Kenji Saito is in his office when the earthquake hits. I escaped up here. 
As I thought there was a chance of a small tsunami, I brought my digital camera with me and stood over here. Tsunamis are well known on this coastline. They've been recorded and feared for centuries. But Sato is shocked as billions of gallons of seawater start rushing ashore. The sea levels began to rise. The waves got bigger in no time. The endless wall of water surges inland. There were still people in cars on the street trying to escape. One of the cars had a woman inside, and I watched it being washed away in front of me. I don't know what happened to her. As soon as I saw houses being washed away, I thought, that's it, and started to panic. I have no recollection of what happened after that. While Sato stands helplessly watching the wave destroy his hometown, elsewhere others are running for their lives. March 11th, 2011. A magnitude 9 earthquake off the coast of Japan has triggered one of the biggest tsunamis in recorded history. In places, the wave reaches over 130 feet high. In the coastal town of Rikuzentakata, volunteer fire brigade commander Yuichi Owada orders people to evacuate. All the water in this whole bay area was pulled back to the sea, so we could see the bottom of the sea along the bay. When we saw the water level reaching halfway up the barrier, we thought, this is dangerous. With the water breaking over the tsunami barrier, Awada knows nothing can stop it now. We escaped in our truck. The real fear of the tsunami came to me after we managed to run away from the danger. Awada heads to high ground and continues to record the shocking destruction. Awada makes it to safety, but the devastating wave continues to forge six miles inland, bulldozing everything in its path. The tsunami claims thousands of lives and causes $235 billion worth of damage. It's the costliest natural disaster ever. Japan rebuilds its towns and communities, fully aware that the sea could destroy it all once again. On the other side of the Pacific, we find a ship-smashing river mouth, the Columbia River Bar, a stretch of water so deadly, it's called the graveyard of the Pacific. Here, the mighty Columbia River collides with the stormy ocean. You've got one of the largest rivers in the continent meeting some of the biggest waves in the world. And where it meets, chaos. It's a deadly cocktail that in three centuries has claimed 2,000 vessels and 700 lives. The Columbia River Bar is one of the most treacherous waterways. It's also one of the busiest. Every year, 3,600 cargo ships must cross these turbulent waters to reach the port of Portland upriver. 
You've got currents, you've got shallows, you've got waves. To navigate these safely, you need specialized pilots. Astoria, Oregon. Captain Robert Johnson has an appointment with a cargo ship, the New Destiny. The visibility is pretty bad, so just getting out and finding it and getting on it will probably present some issues. Johnson is a river bar pilot, a specialist sea captain who guides ships through the dangerous waters of the Columbia River Bar. This three mile wide river mouth is right in the heart of America's stormy Pacific Northwest. The river dumps huge amounts of debris here, producing underwater sandbanks called the river bar. These extreme shallows combine with the river currents and ocean swells to create 20 foot high waves. The result is a ship destroying tempest, requiring specialized sea captains to guide the vessels safely through. With the cargo ship New Destiny about to hit the bar, it's time for Johnson to leave for work. The extreme conditions make a water taxi transfer impossible. Instead, Johnson will be flown to the ship aboard this Seahawk helicopter. It's not exactly your standard commute. Is there anything can go wrong? Everything can go wrong. Johnson is one of just 16 river bar pilots whose skills guide 40 million tons of cargo across the bar every year. But despite 27 years of experience, he can't afford to be complacent. Out here, things can turn deadly in the blink of an eye. When it's bad weather out here, that gets sort of extreme on occasion. The heavy fog means it's impossible for the helicopter to land safely on the ship. Johnson has only one option. Let's hope he has no fear of heights. The Columbia River Bar in America's Pacific Northwest. River bar pilot Captain Robert Johnson is about to board a cargo ship and navigate it through these treacherous waters. But the stormy weather makes a helicopter landing impossible. To board the ship, Johnson is going to have to drop in from 60 feet. Yes, that's right. He's actually going to be winched out of the chopper. In 22 mile per hour wind, this is not for the faint heart. All he can do now is hold on tight and pray that he doesn't get an unwanted dip in the freezing ocean. Come right, three, two, one, hold position. Uh, hold position right here. After his landing, command of the 30,000-ton ship is in Johnson's hands. Johnson has navigated this stretch of water over 10,000 times. We'll be coming in on the main channel here. With his experience at the helm, nothing can go wrong. The motor ship New Destiny is inbound. He safely guides the ship past the dangers, but there's no resting on his laurels. Johnson will soon be heading out to the next ship, waiting to cross the bar. It's a relentless job for a relentless waterway. But the most extreme waterway of all isn't wild, rough water. Instead, it's the grinding, crushing ice of Antarctica. Extreme beauty and one of the most brutal waterways on our planet. It's incredibly hazardous. It's very remote. You are 1,500 miles from civilization. The danger out here near the South Pole? Sea ice. It may look like it's not moving, 
but looks can be deceiving. It's very easy to suddenly discover that your ship is stuck in ice. If the ship isn't ice strengthened, then the ship becomes crushed. It's Christmas Eve, 2013, and on board the Russian polar research ship Academic Shikalsky, journalist Alok Jha is covering a scientific expedition. On Christmas Eve, Alok and the scientists take one last chance to explore the frozen continent before the long journey home. In the morning, it looked like the ice was going to be clear. There was some heavy ice around, but it wasn't coming in our direction. But the seas near Antarctica are the windiest on Earth. And a sudden change in wind quickly surrounds the ship with fast-moving sea ice. Suddenly, there was quite a lot of ice around us. Big sheets of ice. And that was just a few hours. Before they know it, the expedition is encased in ice 10 feet thick. This was old, kind of gnarly, savage stuff, which is very difficult to break. No matter how hard they try, they simply cannot break through the thick ice pack. With the ship trapped, the captain calls for help. Australian and Chinese specialized icebreakers divert towards the stricken ship. Every morning, we got an update saying that tomorrow or later today, one of the icebreakers is going to come near us. But their rescuers never come. The sea ice is just too thick. The options were floating around the ship that we'd have to evacuate. And the only way to evacuate was by helicopter. Eight days after being stranded, conditions finally allow for the helicopter to fly in to the rescue. It was exciting, but also you had a lot to think about. You just got on with the job. Alok and the other passengers are airlifted to the Australian icebreaker 16 miles away. It just goes to show that as powerful as we human beings are, we're puny compared to the environment, and it's the environment that's in charge down there. The crushing seas of Antarctica, the world's most extreme.